We were communicating with the uh, choir and the leaders of the choir about uh, the service this morning. One of my desires was to share some scripture with you that connected directly with at least one of the songs, and it would have been very easy to to do that in many cases, as, as you've heard the songs this morning, how firm a foundation, ain't of that good news, and to the praise of his glory, and drinking at the springs of living water. May God give you a blessing. I won't try to say that in uh, Swahili. And arise, my soul, arise. But when I heard that they were going to be concluding the program with Abide With Me, I thought how fitting of a portion, uh, how fitting of a song, and there are portions of scripture that would fit so very well with that this morning. And so this morning, I want to take just a few moments to look at a couple of verses of scripture. And as we do so, just to impress upon your hearts the importance of the, the abiding presence of the Lord the abiding presence of the Lord. And Henry Light is the man who wrote that poem that then later be became a song. And as is the case with so many of our, our hymns, there is such a rich, rich history typically behind each one of the hymns and why they were written and the life setting in which the author found himself. And I want to share a few of those details with you this morning before we look at this specific portion of scripture about the abiding presence of the Lord, because Henry Light was a pastor. And as a pastor, he was battling tuberculosis and only had a few weeks to live. And his daughter would later recount that three weeks before his death, Henry Light mustered enough strength to preach his last sermon and to perform the Lord's table, a communion service for the very last time. And although he was exhausted by a, a day of public ministry, it was that evening after his last sermon and after his last service that he placed in the hands of one of his relatives the manuscript of what would become then the poem that would become the song, Abide With Me. His daughter recounted that instance. And so it's no wonder he wrote the words with, with he didn't know obviously, three weeks to live, but he knew he was nearing the end of his life. It's no wonder he wrote the words as the choir has already sung for you this morning, words like Abide With Me. Fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. And then verse 2 says, swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay in all around I see. O oh, thou who changest not abide with me. We don't know what exact passage of scripture Henry Light had in mind when he penned those words to that poem, but I can't help but wonder if at least one of the portions of scripture that he may have had in mind was what we find here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verses 5 and 6. Notice what the word of God says in Hebrews 13 and 5 and 6. Beginning in verse 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You see, the abiding presence of of the Lord should make a remarkable impact on our lives. It made a remarkable impact on the life of Henry Light as he thought about God's presence and as he penned that poem and said, Lord, ab abide with me. As he was facing the, the last hours of his life on earth, he understood the importance of the abiding presence of the, of the Lord. And so he, he penned those words really as a prayer of, Lord, be with me, abide with me through these dark and difficult hours of the, of the last days of my life. And those are fitting words for us today as well as we think about the abiding presence of the Lord and the remarkable impact it really ought to have on our lives. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying here in these verses of Scripture. Yes, the very center of the, the verse of Scripture has to do with the presence of the Lord, but, but also he also challenges us in terms of the way that that then ought to impact us. The fact that the Lord is our helper, how then does that impact us, the fact that the Lord is with us, that he'll never leave us nor forsake us. How does that make a difference in your life and how you live today and how you'll go out of here tomorrow and live your life? The writer of Hebrews, I think, points out two specific things that I just want to quickly share with you this morning in relationship to the abiding presence of the Lord. Two ways that the abiding presence of the Lord ought to impact how you live and how I live. Number one, the abiding presence of the Lord should produce in my life and in your life contentment. 
Isn't it interesting in verse 5 what the writer of Hebrews says before saying, the Lord will never leave you, the Lord will never forsake you, the Lord is your helper. Before he says that, what does he challenge the readers with? He challenges them with this idea in verse 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what he says is the fact that God never leaves us nor forsakes us ought to bring a sense of contentment in our lives, a sense of contentment that says, you know, God is all I need. I think it's interesting that Charles Haddon Spurgeon said the following. He said, in all of my life, I've never had one person confess the sin of covetousness to me. Never had one person, if there's any sin that we as Christians have a tendency to think of as just kind of normal, part of life, especially as American Christians that seem to always want more, it's the sin of covetousness. And yet the Bible addresses the issue of covetousness in a very pointed way here when it says, don't be covetous, be content, because God's never going to leave you nor forsake you. God is enough. God is all sufficient. Really, we need nothing else other than God. And so the abiding presence of the Lord in our lives ought to be such that it causes us to be content with whatever it is that God gives us. You see, the core issue of contentment is how much you value God. When you value, when I value God like we ought to, then we'll be content with whatever it is he allows into our lives or whatever it is that he doesn't allow into our lives. And so contentment is the product of God being enough in our lives. You see, contentment can never be found in the abundance of stuff, the abundant possession of stuff. It can only be found in the abiding presence of the Savior. Contentment is the consequence of communion with your Creator. And so this morning, if you find yourself not being content, you ought to ask yourself the question, where is my relationship with God? Is God truly enough? I like to think of it this way. Attempting to find satisfaction in material things is to the soul what drinking salt water is to the body. You know what happens when somebody drinks salt water thinking that they are going to quench their thirst by doing so. Just the opposite happens. Salt water actually dehydrates them and causes them to become more and more and more thirsty. And so for us as Christians who try to find satisfaction and contentment in material things and the things of this world is really doing the very same thing to our souls that drinking salt water does to a person's body. Instead of satisfying you, it just makes you more thirsty, more yearning for what it is that you're you're looking for. But when you find satisfaction and contentment in in the abiding presence of God and the fact that he will never leave you, you nor forsake you. That brings you real contentment. That brings you real satisfaction. I want to ask a question that's almost ridiculous when you really think about it. The question is simply this, is God enough? Are we content with God? Do you realize how ridiculous that question really is? Because by comparison to anything else that would offer us happiness, that would offer us satisfaction, that would offer us contentment in this world, nothing compares with God. And so really it's silly for us to even ask the question of, am I content with God? Is God enough? Of course God's enough. And so why aren't we content? Why aren't we satisfied with what it is that God has given us or what it is God has not chosen to give us? Because in reality, God isn't enough in terms of how we live. He is enough. Don't misunderstand me. He is enough. But in terms of how we live, oftentimes we think, oh, I would just be happy if I had this or had that, or if this circumstance was erased from my life, or that circumstance was erased from my life, or this circumstance was brought into my my life, I'd be happy then. No, you'll only be happy if you find your contentment in the abiding presence of God who will never leave you nor forsake you. And so God must be enough for us. You can't improve on God. None of us can. And so the abiding presence of the Lord ought to produce in every one of our hearts, abide with me, ought to produce in in my heart and yours contentment. God is more than enough. But then secondly, it ought to also produce another thing, not just contentment, it ought to produce confidence. 
Notice how the writer of Hebrews goes on to state it in verse 6 when he says this, so we may boldly say, remember this is just on the heels of I will never leave you nor forsake you. So on the heels of that idea, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? And so that ought to produce confidence in our lives. The very idea here that's being communicated in verse 6 when he says, so we may boldly say, is the idea of confidence. As a matter of fact, the Greek word that is used there is oftentimes translated either courage or courageously or confidently. It's the same Greek word that is found in 2 Corinthians in, ver in chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8 where the Bible says this, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8, it says, so we are always Confident, that's the Greek word. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We are, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident. So there it is the second time. We are confident. Yes, well, please, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So familiar verses of scripture to us that talk about our confidence and the fact that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's that idea that is encapsulated here in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 13 when it says, so we may boldly say, so we may confidently say, so we may even courageously say, what? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And so it gives us a sense of, of confidence as we place our confidence in God. If God is your helper, nothing else matters. I mean, you think of this in terms even of other passages of Scripture, like Romans 8, 31, the latter portion of the verse where it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Almost a ridiculous question again, because the answer is nobody. If God is for us, if, if God is with us, if the Lord is my helper, why should I fear? What can man do to me? And so it gives us a sense of confidence to know that God is my helper, that God is with me, that God will never leave me, God will never forsake me. He is all you need to face whatever it is that comes into your life. He's all you need. He's all I need. No matter what you are facing in your life, the abiding presence of the Lord, of God, should inject confidence and courage into your very soul. Whether you're facing cancer, whether you're facing marriage difficulties, whether you're facing a job loss, whether you're facing health problems or, or physical exhaustion or emotional exhaustion or, or loneliness or depression or a struggle with an addiction or a sin issue or financial burdens, what, whatever it is that you're facing in life, you ought to be able to say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Or maybe put it this way, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can cancer do to me? I will not fear what can financial problems do to me. I will not fear what, what can loneliness do to me. I will not fear what can this burden or that problem or this struggle or that difficulty, what can it do to me because the Lord is with me and the Lord is my helper. So whatever you're facing today, the very abiding presence of the Lord ought to bring you a sense of confidence. I will not fear what can you fill in the blank, do to me. You see, the abiding presence of the Lord makes all of the difference. All of the difference in my life and all the difference in your life. It made all the difference in Henry Light's life so that he could pen words as we've already read to you and I want to add a couple more stanzas. He could pen words like abide with me. Fast falls the even tide. The darkness deepens. Lord with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. And then he would later write in other stanzas things like, I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. And then he concludes with, hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O oh Lord, abide with me. The abiding presence of the Lord makes all the difference.
And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for that promise that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And I pray today that as we dwell upon that and the other truths that we've heard in song and through scripture today, that it would bring confidence and courage to every one of our souls. And Lord, that we would look to your abiding presence whenever we face life difficulties, that we might be found faithful as we seek to serve you. We pray in Jesus' name.